Necromancy in Nayat. Dead longing sundered evermore from pain. How dim and sweet the shadow-hearted love, the happiness that perished lovers prove, in Nayat, far beyond the sable main. Song of the Galley Slaves Yadar, prince of a nomad people in the half-desert region known as Zyra, had followed throughout many kingdoms a clue that was often more elusive than broken gossamer. For thirteen moons he had sought Dalili, his betrothed, whom the slave traders of Shah Karag, swift and cunning as desert falcons, had reft from the tribal encampment with nine other maidens, while Yadar and his men were hunting the black gazelles of Zyra. Fierce was the grief of Yadar, and fiercer still his wrath, when he came back at eve to the ravaged tents. He had sworn then a great oath to find Dalili, whether in slave mart or brothel or harem, whether dead or living, whether tomorrow or after the lapse of gray years. The tracks of the slaver's camels ran plainly toward the iron gates of Shah Karag, lying many leagues away in the west. Because of similar raidings, the nomads had long been at war with the people of that infamous marketplace, where women were the chief merchandise. Knowing that the high-walled city was impregnable to assault by his little band of followers, Yadar disguised himself as a rug merchant, and accompanied by four of his men in like attire, with certain hoarded heirlooms of the tribe for a stock in trade, he appeared before the shut gates and was admitted without challenge by the guards. Listening discreetly to the gossip of the bazaars, he learned that the raiders had not remained in Shah Karag, but after selling most of their captives to local dealers, they had gone on without delay toward the great empires of the sunset, taking with them Dalili and her fairest companions. It was said that they hoped to sell Dalili to some opulent king or emperor who would pay a city's ransom for the wild, rare beauty of the outland princess. Weary and perilous was the quest to which Yadar and his followers now dedicated themselves. Still disguised as rug merchants, they joined a caravan that was departing on the route taken by the slavers. From realm to realm they followed a doubtful trail, sometimes led astray by vain rumors. In Tinarath, hearing that a nomad girl of strange loveliness had lately been purchased by the king, they entered the palace harem on a night of storm, slaying the griffin-like monsters who warded its balconies and braving the hideous pitfalls that had been set for intruders in the inner halls. They found the girl, who was not Dalili, but another of the maidens reaved from Yadar's people, and swiftly, amid the bewildered hubbub of the awakening palace, they carried her away into the darkness and storm. She knew little of the fate of Dalili, saying that the princess had been parted from her in Tinarath and had gone with the slave traders toward Zul Basser, for the king of Tinarath had refused to pay the vast sum demanded for Dalili. Now, when they were safely beyond the borders of Tinarath, Yadar sent the girl back toward Zyra with one of his tribesmen, and he and the others resumed their search and were brought near to death amid the springless dunes of the waste lying between Tinarath and Zulbasser. And in Zulbasser, Yadar learned that Delili had been offered to the king who, caring not for a sun-dark beauty, had declined to buy her. And after that, the princess and her captors had gone northward to an undeclared destination. But before the nomads could follow, Yadar's companions were seized by a strange fever and died swiftly, and their bodies, according to custom, were claimed by the priesthood of a great temple-dwelling ghoul who was worshipped in that city. So Yadar went on alone, and after much random wandering, he came to Oroth, a western seaport of the land of Zylak. There, for the first time in several moons, he heard a rumor that might concern Dalili for the people of Oroth were still gossiping about the departure of a rich galley bearing a lovely outland girl who had been bought by the emperor of Zylak and sent to the ruler of the far southern kingdom of Yoros as a gift concluding a treaty between these realms. Yadar, who had almost yielded to despair, was now hopeful of finding his beloved, since, by the description the people had given, he thought that the girl was indeed none other than Dalili. Nothing remained of the precious weavings of the tribe which he had brought with him to sell as merchandise, but through the sale of his camels he procured money with which to engage his passage on a ship that was about to sail for Euros. The ship was a small merchant galley, laden with grain and wine that was wont to coast up and down, 
hugging closely the winding western shores of the continent Zothique, and venturing never beyond eyeshot of land. On a clear blue summer day it departed from Oroth with all auguries for a safe and tranquil voyage. But on the third morn after leaving port, a tremendous wind blew suddenly from the low-lying sandy shore they were then skirting, and with it, blotting the heavens and sea, there came a blackness as of night thickened with clouds. The sails and oars could win no headway against the gale, and the vessel was swept far out to sea, going with the blind tempest. After two days the wind fell from its ravening fury, and was soon no more than a vague whisper, and the skies cleared, leaving a bright azure vault from horizon to horizon. But nowhere was there any land visible, only a waste of waters that still roared and tossed turbulently without wind, pouring ever westward in a cataracting tide that was too swift and strong for the galley to stem. And the galley was borne on irresistibly by that strange current, even as by the hurricane. Yadar, who was the sole passenger, marveled much at this thing, and he was struck by the pale terror on the faces of the captain and crew. And, looking again at the sea, he remarked a singular darkening of its waters, which assumed from moment to moment a hue as of old blood commingled with more and more of blackness, though above it the sun shone untarnished. So he made inquiry of the captain, a greybeard from Euros named Agor, who had sailed the ocean for forty summers, and the captain answered with many seafaring oaths, This I had apprehended when the storm bore us westwardly, for know now that we have fallen into the grip of that terrible ocean stream which is called by mariners the Black River. Evermore the stream surges and swiftens toward the fabled place of the sun's outermost setting, till it pours at last from the world's rim. Between us now and that final verge, there is no land, saving the evil land of Neat, which is called also the Isle of Necromancers. And I know not which were the worse fate, to be wrecked on that infamous isle, or hurled into space with the waters falling eternally from Earth's edge. From either place... There is no return for living men such as we, and from the Isle of Nayat none go forth except the ill sorcerers who people it, and the dead who are raised up and controlled by their sorcery. In magical ships that breast the full current of the Black River, the sorcerers sail at will to other strands, and beneath their necromancy, to fulfill their wicked errands, the dead men swim without pause for many days and nights, whithersoever the masters may send them. Yadar, who knew little of sorcerers and necromancy, was somewhat incredulous concerning the matters whereof the captain spoke. But he saw that the blackening waters streamed always more wildly and torrentially toward the skyline, as if pouring adown some submarine slope of earth that steepened to the final rim and verily there was small hope that the galley could regain its southward course, and he was troubled chiefly by the thought that he should never reach the kingdom of Yoros, where he had dreamt to find Dalili. All that day the vessel was borne on without respite by the dark seas racing weirdly beneath an airless and immaculate heaven. It followed the silent orange sunset into a night filled with large, unquivering stars, and at length, it was overtaken by the stilly flying amber morn. But still there was no abating of the waters, and neither land nor cloud was discernible in the vastness about the galley. Yadar held little converse with Agor and the crew, after questioning them vainly as to the reason of the ocean's blackness, which was a thing that no man understood. Despair was upon him, but, standing at the bulwark, he watched the sky and wave with an alertness born of his nomad life. Toward middle afternoon he descried far off a strange vessel, rigged with funereal purple sails that drove steadily on an eastering course against the mighty current. At this he cried out in wonder, calling the captain's attention to that vessel. And the captain, with a muttering of outlandish oaths, told him that it was a ship belonging to the necromancers of Neot, whose malign magic was more cogent than the tide of the Black River. Soon the purple sails were lost to vision. But a little later, Yadar perceived certain objects, queerly resembling human heads, 
that passed in the high billowing water to the galley's leeward, as if swimming easily towards Zothique on the route of that necromantic ship. Deeming that no mortal living men could swim thus, and remembering that which the captain had told him concerning the dead swimmers who went forth from Neot, Yadar shivered a little with such trepidation as a brave man may feel in the presence of preternatural things, and he did not speak of the matter, and seemingly the headlike objects were not noticed by any of his companions. Still the galley drove on, its oarsmen sitting idly at the oars, and the captain standing listless beside the untended helm. Now as the sun declined above that tumultuous ebon ocean, it seemed that a great bank of thundercloud arose from the west, long and low-lying at first, but surging rapidly skyward with mountainous domes and craggy battlements. Ever higher it loomed, revealing the menace as of piled cliffs and somber, awful sea capes. But its form changed not in the manner of clouds, and Yadar, watching it closely, knew it at last for an island bulking far aloft in the long-rayed sunset. From it, a chill effluence of evil came like a sighing breath, and a shadow was thrown for leagues, darkening still more the sable waters, as if with the fall of untimely night, and in the shadow the foam crests flashing upon hidden reefs were white as the bared teeth of death, and Yadar needed not the shrill frightened cries of his companions to tell him that this was the terrible Isle of Neant. Direly the current swiftened, raging, as it raced onward for battle with the rock-fanged shore, and the voices of the mariners, praying loudly to their gods, were drowned by its clamor. Yadar, standing in the prow, gave only a silent prayer to the dim, fatal deity of his tribe, and his eyes searched the towering isle like those of a sea-flown hawk, seeing the bare, horrific crags and the spaces of sullen forest creeping seaward between the crags, and the white mounting of breakers on a shadowy strand. And he discerned, on the lofty downs behind the shore, the furtive scattered roofs of houses pale amid cypress trees that clotted the gloom with funereal umbrage. Shrouded and ominous of bale was the island's aspect, and the heart of Yadar sank like a plummet in unsunned seas. As the galley drew nearer to land, he thought that he beheld people moving darkly, visible in the lapsing of surges on a low beach, and then hidden once more by foam and spindrift. Ere he saw them a second time, the galley was hurled with thunderous crashing and grinding on a reef covered by the torrent waters. The whole forepart of its prow and bottom were broken in, and being lifted from the reef by a great comber, it filled instantly and sank. And of those who had sailed from Oroth in the vessel, Yadar alone leapt free ere its foundering. But since he was little skilled as a swimmer, he was drawn under quickly, and was like to have drowned in the maelstroms of that evil sea. His senses left him, and in his brain, like a lost son returned from yesteryear, he beheld the face of Dalili. And with Dalili, in a bright phantasmagoria, there came the happy days that had been ere his bereavement. The visions passed, and he awoke struggling, with the bitterness of the sea in his mouth, and its loudness in his ears, and its rushing darkness all about him. And as his senses quickened, he became aware of a form that swam close behind him, and arms that supported him amid the waters. He lifted his head in the twilight and saw dimly the pale neck and half-averted face of his rescuer, and the long black hair that floated from wave to wave. Touching the body at his side, he knew it for that of a woman. Mazed and wildered though he was by the sea's buffeting, a sense of something familiar stirred within him, and he thought that he had known somewhere at some former time a girl with like hair and similar curving of cheek, but he could not remember clearly. And, trying to remember, he touched the woman again and felt in his fingers a strange coldness from her naked body. At this he wondered a little, but forgot his wonder in the wildness of that sea through which he was borne by the swimmer. Miraculous was the woman's strength and skill, for she rode easily the dreadful mounting and falling of the surges. Yadar, floating as in a cradle upon her arm, beheld the nearing shore from the billows' summits, and hardly it seemed that any swimmer, however able, could win alive through the ponderous cataracting of that surf on the stony strand. 
Dizzily at the last, they were hurled upward as if the surf would fling them against the highmost crag. But as if checked by some enchantment, the wave fell with a slow, lazy undulation, and Yadar and his rescuer, released by its ebbing, lay unhurt on a shelfy beach. Uttering no word nor turning to look at Yadar, the woman rose swiftly to her feet, and beckoning the nomad prince to follow, she moved away in the deathly blue dusk that had fallen upon Nayat. Yadar, arising and following the woman, heard a strange and eerie chanting of voices above the sea's tumult, and saw a fire that burned weirdly with the colors of driftwood at some distance before him in the dusk. Straightly, toward the fire and the voices, the woman walked in the fashion of a somnambulist, and Yadar, with eyes grown used to that doubtful twilight, saw that the fire blazed in the mouth of a low sunken cleft between crags that overloomed the beach, and behind the fire, like tall, evilly posturing shadows, there stood the dark-clad figures of those who chanted. Now memory returned to him of that which the galley's captain had said regarding the people of Nayot and their necromantic practices, and with the memory came misgiving. For the very sound of that chanting, albeit in an unknown language, seemed to suspend the heartward flowing of his veins, and to set the tomb's chillness in his marrow. And though he was little learned in such matters, the thought came to him that the words uttered were of sorcerous import and power. Going forward, the woman bowed low before the chanters in such fashion as a slave, and stood waiting submissively. The men, who were three in number, continued their incantation without pausing, and they seemed not to perceive the presence of Yadar as he entered the firelight. Gaunt as starved herons they were, and great of stature, with a common likeness as of brothers, and sharply ridged were their faces, where shadows inhabited their hollow cheeks, and their sunk eyes were visible only by red sparks reflected within them from the blaze, and their eyes, as they chanted, seemed to glare afar on the darkling sea, and on things hidden by dusk and distance. And Yadar, coming before them, was aware of swift horror and repugnance that made his gorge rise as if he had encountered, in a place given wholly to death, the powerful evil ripeness of corruption. High leaped the fire as he neared it, with a writhing of tongues that were like blue and green serpents coiling amid serpents of yellow, and the light flickered brightly on the face and breasts of that woman who had saved him from the Black River. And Yadar, beholding her clearly, knew why she had stirred within him a dim remembrance, for she was none other than his lost love, Dalili. Forgetting the presence of the dark chanters and the ill renown of that isle to which the seas had brought him, he sprang forward to clasp his beloved, crying out her name in an agony of rapture. But she answered not his cry, and responded to his embrace only with a faint trembling. And Yadar, sorely perplexed and dismayed, was aware of the deathly coldness that crept into his fingers and smote through his very raiment from her flesh. Mortally pale and languid were the lips that he kissed, and it seemed that no breath emerged between them nor was there any rising and falling of the wan bosom against his. In the wide, beautiful eyes that she turned to him, he found only a drowsy voidness, and such recognition as a sleeper gives when but half awakened, relapsing quickly into slumber thereafter. "'Art thou indeed, Dalili?' he said, and she answered somnolently in a toneless, indistinct voice, "'I am Dalili.' To Yadar, baffled by mystery, chilled, forlorn, and aching, it was as if she had spoken from a land farther away than all the weary leagues of his search throughout Zothik. Fearing to understand the change that had come upon her, he said tenderly, Surely thou knowest me, for I am thy lover, the Prince Yadar, who has sought thee through half the kingdoms of earth, and has sailed afar for thy sake on the unsured sea and she replied like one bemused by some heavy drug, in a soulless voice, as if echoing his words without true comprehension. Surely I know thee. And to Yadar there was no comfort in her reply, and his concernment was not allayed by the parrotings with which she answered all his other loving speeches and queries. He knew not that the three chanters had all ceased their incantation, 
and verily he had forgotten their presence in his finding of Dalili. But as he stood holding the girl closely, the men came toward him, and one of them clutched his arm, and the man hailed him by name and addressed him, albeit uncouthly, in a language commonly spoken throughout many parts of Zathik, saying, We bid thee welcome to the Isle of Nayat, from which no living traveler may return. Yadar, feeling a dread suspicion, interrogated the man fiercely. What manner of beings are ye, and why is Dalili in this place, and what have ye done to her? I am Vashar, a necromancer, the man replied readily, and these others with me are my sons, Vokal and Uldula, who are also necromancers. We dwell in a house behind the crags, and are attended by the drowned people that our sorcery has called up from the sea to a semblance of life and animation. Among our servants is this girl, Dalili, together with the whole crew of that ship in which she sailed from Oroth. For like the vessel in which thou camest later, the ship was blown far a sea and was taken by the inelectable Black River, and was wrecked finally on the reefs of Neath. And my sons and I, chanting that powerful formula which requires no use of circle or pentacle, summoned ashore the drowned company, even as we have now summoned the crew of that other vessel, from which thou alone wert saved alive by the necromantic swimmer at our command, for a certain purpose. Vacharn ended, and stood peering into the dusk intently, and Yadar at that moment heard behind him a noise of slow footsteps coming upward across the shingle from the surf. Turning, he saw emerge from the livid twilight the old captain of that merchant galley in which he had voyaged so unwillingly to Nayat, and behind the captain were the sailors and oarsmen. With the paces of sleepwalkers they approached the firelight, the sea water dripping heavily from their raiment and hair, and drooling from their mouths. Some were sorely bruised, and others came stumbling or dragging with limbs broken by the rocks on which that torrential sea had flung them, and on all their faces was the ghastly look of men who have suffered the doom of drowning. Stiffly, like automatons, they made obeisance in a body before Vacharn and his sons, acknowledging thus their thraldom to those who had raised them from deep death. In their glassily staring eyes there was no recognition of Yadar, no awareness of outward things, and they spoke only in dull, rote-like recognition of certain obscure words addressed to them by the necromancers. To Yadar it was as if he too stood and moved like the living dead in a dark, hollow, half-conscious dream. Even thus, walking side by side with Dalili and followed by those others, he was led by the enchanters through a dusky ravine that wound secretly toward the uplands of Neot. Obediently he went, but in his heart there was small joy at the finding of Delili, and his love was companioned by a sick despair. Vacharn lit the way with a brand of driftwood plucked from the fire, and Yadar beheld vaguely by its flickering the black and cruel precipices of a steepening gorge and the dwarfish crooked pines that leaned malignantly from high ledges, as if to cast with wizard hands a malediction upon the wayfarers. Anon a bloated moon rose red as with the sannies mingled blood behind them, over the wild racing sea, and ere its orb had cleared to a death-like paleness, they emerged from the gorge on a stony fell where stood the house of the three necromancers. Long and low-lying was the house, built of dark granite, with crouching wings, half hidden amid the foliage of close-grown cypresses. Behind it a cliff beetled, overhanging it starkly, and above the cliff were somber slopes and ridges piled in the moonlight, rising afar toward the mountainous center of Neot. To Yadar it seemed that the mansion was a place preempted by death, for no lights burned in its portals and windows, and a silence came from it to meet the stillness of the wan heavens. But when the necromancers neared the threshold, a word was spoken by Vacharn, echoing distantly in the inner halls and chambers, and as if in answer, lamps were illumined suddenly everywhere, filling the house as with monstrous yellow eyes, and people appeared instantly within the portals like bowing shadows. 
but the faces of these beings were blanched by the tomb's pallor, and some were mottled with green decay, or marked by the torturous gnawing of maggots. Later, in a great hall of the house, Yadar was bidden to seat himself at a table, where Vacharn and Vokal and Uldula were wont to sit alone during their meals. The table stood on a sort of dais formed by gigantic flagstones, and below, in the main hall, the dead were gathered about other tables, numbering nearly two score, and among them sat the girl Dalili, looking never toward Yadar. He, though sorely sick at heart, would have joined her, unwilling to be parted from her side, but a deep languor was upon him, as if an unspoken spell had enthralled his limbs and he could no longer move at his own volition, but must obey in all things the will of Vacharn. Dully he sat, observing with small wonder the grimness and taciturny of his hosts, who, dwelling always with the silent dead, had apparently assumed no little part of their manner and similitude, and he saw more clearly than before the common likeness of the three, for all, it seemed, were as brothers of one birth, rather than parent and sons and all were like ageless things, being neither old nor young in the fashion of ordinary men. Yadar could distinguish Vacharn from his sons only by the darker hue of his garments and the greater breadth of brow and shoulders, and he knew Vokal from Uldula merely by a sharper pitch of voice and a deeper hollowing of the gaunt cheeks. And more and more was he aware of that weird evil which emanated from the three— powerful and abhorrent as an exhalation of hidden death. In the thraldom that weighed upon him, he scarcely marveled at the serving of the strange supper that followed. Though meats were brought in by no palpable agency, and wines poured out as if by the air itself, and the passing of the bearers to and fro was betrayed only by a rustle of doubtfully dying footsteps and a light chillness that came and went. Mutely, with stiff gestures and movements, the dead began to eat at their laden table. But the necromancers refrained from the victuals before them in an attitude of waiting, and Vacharn, in explanation, said to the nomad, There are still others who will sup with us tonight. And Yadar, for the first time, perceived that a vacant chair had been set beside the chair of Vacharn. Then, from an inner doorway, there entered the hall with hasty strides a man of great thews and stature, naked and brown almost to blackness. Savage of aspect was the man, and his eyes were dilated as if with rage or terror, and little flecks of foam were on his thick purple lips. And close behind him, lifting in menace their heavy rusty scimitars, there came two liches, like guards who attend a prisoner. This man is a cannibal, said Vacharn. Our servants have captured him for us in the forest beyond the mountain, which is peopled mainly by such savages. Then, with a dark irony couching behind the words, he added, Only the strong and courageous are summoned living to this mansion, and are suffered to eat with my sons and me at our table. Not idly, O Prince Yadar, wert thou chosen for this honor among all who sailed in the merchant galley from Oroth. Observe closely all that follows. The giant savage had paused within the threshold, as if fearing the hall's occupants more than the wicked weapons of his guards. At a signal from Vacharn, one of the liches slashed his left shoulder with the rusty blade, and blood reeled copiously from a deep wound as the cannibal came forward beneath that prompting. Convulsively he trembled, in such wise as a frightened animal, looking wildly to either side for an avenue of escape, and only after a second prompting did he mount the dais and approach the necromancer's table. But after certain hollow-sounding words had been uttered by Vacharn, the man seated himself, still trembling, in the chair beside the master, opposite to Yadar, and behind him, with high-raised weapons, there stationed themselves the ghastly guards, whose features were those of men a fortnight dead. There is still another guest, said Vacharn, a guest who prefers to sup when others have supped. He will come at his own time. Without further ceremony, he began to eat. 
and Yadar, though with little appetence, followed suit. Hardly did the prince perceive the savor of those viands with which his plate was piled, nor could he have sworn whether the vintages he drank were sour or dulcet, for his thoughts were divided between Dalili and the strangeness and horror about him. The utterances of Acharn and the presence of the cannibal and the reason of his own presence at that table were obscure to him, and he felt in all this the incumbents of an ill mystery. And seeing that there was no longer a vacant place at the table, he was perplexed by the necromancer's reference to the coming of still another guest. As he ate and drank, it seemed that his senses were sharpened weirdly, so that he grew aware of eldritch shadows moving between the lamps, and heard the chill sibilance of whispers that checked his very blood. And there came to him, from the peopled hall, every odor that is exhaled by mortality between the recentness of death and the end of corruption. Vacharn and his sons addressed themselves to the meal with the unconcern of those long habituated to such surroundings. But the cannibal, whose fear was still palpable in his features and members, ate only a few scant mouthfuls, and these at the direct prompting of Vacharn, who appeared very solicitous of his guest's appetite. Blood, in two heavy rills, ran unceasingly down his bosom from his wounded shoulders, and fell at last on the stone flags with an audible dripping. But of this, in his sore terror, he seemed unaware. Finally, at the urging of Vacharn, who spoke to him in the cannibal's own language, he was persuaded to drink from a cup of wine that had long stood before him untasted. This wine, Yadar perceived, was not the same that had been served to the rest of the company being of a violet color, dark as the nightshade's blossom, while the other wine was a poppy red. Hardly had the man tasted it when he sank back in his chair with the appearance of one smitten helpless by palsy. The wine cup, rilling the remnant of its contents, was still clutched in his rigid fingers. There was no movement, no trembling of his limbs, and his eyes were wide open and staring, as if consciousness still remained within him. A dire suspicion sprang up in Yadar, and no longer could he eat the food and drink the wine of the necromancers, and much was he puzzled by the actions of Vacharn and Vokal and Uldula, who, abstaining likewise, turned in their chairs and peered steadfastly at a certain portion of the floor behind Vacharn, between the table and the hall's inner end. Rising a little in his seat, Yadar looked down across the table and saw that all three were staring at a small hole in one of the flagstones, which he had not hitherto perceived. The hole was such as might be inhabited by some tiny animal. But Yadar could not surmise the nature of a beast that burrowed in solid granite. Now, in a loud, clear voice, Vacharn spoke the single word, Ezrit, as if calling the name of one that he wished to summon. Not long thereafter, two little sparks of fire appeared in the darkness of the hole, and from it sprang a creature having somewhat the size and likeness of a weasel, but even longer and thinner of body. The fur of the creature was a rusted black, and its paws were like tiny hairless hands, and its beaded eyes of flaming fulvous yellow seemed to hold the malign wisdom and malevolence of a demon. Swiftly, with writhing movements that gave it the air of a furred serpent, it ran forward beneath the chair occupied by the cannibal and began to drink greedily the pool of blood that had dripped down on the floor from his wounds. Then, while horror fastened upon the heart of Yadar, it leapt to the knees of the huge savage and thence to his left shoulder, where the deepest wound had been inflicted, and there the thing applied itself to the still bleeding cot from which it sucked in the fashion of a weasel, and the blood ceased to flow down on the man's body and the man stirred not in his chair, but his eyes still widened, slowly, with a horrible glaring, till the balls were aisled in livid white, and his lips fell slackly apart, showing teeth that were strong and pointed as those of a shark. The necromancers had resumed their eating, with eyes attentive on the small bloodthirsty monster, and it came to Yudar that this was the other guest expected by Vacharn. Whether the thing was an actual weasel or a sorcerer's familiar, he knew not. But anger followed upon his horror before the plight of the cannibal, and drawing a sword he had carried through all his travels and voyagings, he sprang to his feet and would have tried to kill the monster. 
But Vacharn described in the air a peculiar sign with his forefinger, and it seemed that the prince's arm was suspended in mid-stroke, and his fingers became weak as those of a newborn babe, and the sword fell from his hand, ringing loudly on the dais. Thereafter, as if by the unspoken will of Vacharn, he was constrained to seat himself again at the table. Insatiable to all appearance was the thirst of the weasel-like creature, for after many minutes had gone by in that hall of abominations, it continued to suck the blood of the savage, and from moment to moment the man's mighty thews became strangely shrunken, and the bones and taut sinews showed starkly beneath the wrinkling folds of skin. His face was like the chapless face of death, his limbs were lean as those of an old mummy, but the thing that battened upon him had increased in girth only so much as a stoat increases by sucking the blood of some farmyard fowl. By this token, Yadar knew that the thing was indeed a demon, and was no doubt the familiar of Vacharn. Entranced with terror, he sat regarding it, till the creature dropped from the dry skin and bones of the cannibal, and ran with an evil writhing and slithering to its hole in the flagstone. Weird was the life that now began for Yadar in the house of the necromancers. Upon him there rested by day and night the malign thraldom that had overpowered him during that first supper, and he moved as one who could not wholly awake from some benumbing dream. It seemed that his volition was in some way controlled by those masters of the living dead. But more than this, he was held by the old enchantment of his love for Dalili, though the love had now turned to a spell of despair. He ate at the table of the necromancers and slept in a chamber adjoining that of Vacharn, a chamber unlocked and without tangible bars to hinder his going. Dully he foresaw the fate designed for him, since Vacharn spoke seldom except with grim ironies, referring to the doom of the cannibal and of the thirst of the weasel-like familiar whose name was Ezrit, and he learned that Ezrit had undertaken to serve Vacharn for a certain term, receiving in guerdon thereof, at the full of each moon, the blood of a living man chosen for redoubtable strength and valor. And it was clear to Yadar that, in default of some miracle or sorcery beyond that of the necromancers, his days of life were limited by the moon's period. For other than himself and the masters, there was no person in all that mansion who had not already passed through the bitter gates of death thereby becoming unacceptable to Ezrit. Lonely was the house, standing far apart from all neighbors. Other necromancers dwelt on the shores of Naot, served mainly by the people they had evoked from drowning after shipwreck. But betwixt these and the hosts of Yadar there was little intercourse, and beyond the wild mountains that divided the isle there dwelt only certain tribes of anthropophagi, who warred perpetually with each other in the black woods of pine and cypress, but feared the necromancers and their thralls. The dead were housed in deep catacomb-like caves of the cliff behind the mansion, lying all night in rows of stone coffins and coming forth in daily resurrection to do the tasks ordained by the masters. Some were compelled to till the rocky gardens on a slope sequestered from sea wind. Others tended the sable goats and cattle of the isle, and still others were sent out as divers for pearls in the sea that raged and ravened prodigiously, not to be dared by living swimmers, on the bleak atolls and headlands adorned with granite. Of such pearls Vacharn had amassed a mighty store through years exceeding the common span of life, and sometimes, in a ship that sailed contrary to the Black River, he or one of his sons would voyage to Zothique with certain of the dead for crew, and would trade the pearls for such things as their magic was unable to raise up in Nayat. Strange it was to Yadar to see the companions of his voyage passing to and fro with the other liches, recognizing him not, or greeting him only in mindless echo of his own salutations. And bitter it was, yet never without a dim, sorrowful sweetness, to behold Dalili and speak with her, trying vainly to revive the lost ardent love in a heart that had gone fathom deep into oblivion and had not returned therefrom. And always, with a desolate yearning, he seemed to grope toward her across a gulf more terrible than the stemless tide that poured forever about the isle of the necromancers. Dalili, who had swum from childhood in the sunken lakes of Zyra, 
was among those enforced to dive for pearls in that ebon water. Often Yadar would accompany her to the shore and await her return from the mad surges, and at whiles he was tempted to fling himself after her, and find, if such were possible, the peace of very death. This he would surely have done, but amid the eerie wilderments of his plight and the gray webs of sorcery woven about him, it seemed that his old strength and resolution were wholly lacking. Now, night by night, the moon was sharpened above the craggy isle, and it became a heavy scythe and then a thin scimitar. And after the interlunar dusk, it broadened from a frail saber to a sickle, and digit by digit swelled toward the gibbous orb and the plenilune. Yadar, supping with the sorcerers as it changed, was not unregardful of that burrow in the granite flag from which the weasel demon Ezrit had slithered forth to suck the blood of the cannibal. But beneath his extreme languor and lethargy, he hardly feared that verminous death which would dart upon him at the time of the moon's fullness. One day, toward sunset time as the month drew to its end, Vokal and Uldula approached the prince where he stood waiting on a rock-walled beach while Dalili dived after pearls far out in the torrent waters. Speaking no word, they beckoned him with furtive signs, and Yadar, vaguely curious as to their intent, suffered them to lead him from the beach and by perilous paths that wound from crag to crag above the curving seashore. Ere the fall of darkness, they came suddenly to a small landlocked harbor, whose existence had been heretofore unsuspected by the nomad. In that placid bay, beneath the deep umbrage of the isle, there rode a galley with somber purple sails, resembling the ship that Yadar had discerned moving steadily towards Zothik against the full tide of the Black River. Yadar was much bewondered, nor could he divine why they had brought him to the hidden harbor, nor the import of their gestures as they pointed out the strange vessel. Then, in a hushed and covert whisper, as if fearing to be overheard in that remote place, Vokal said to him, If thou wilt aid my brother and me in the execution of a certain plan which we have conceived, thou shalt have the use of yonder galley in quitting Naot, and with thee, if such be thy desire, thou shalt take the girl Dalili whom thou lovest, together with certain of the dead mariners for oarsmen. Favoured by the powerful gales which our enchantments will evoke for thee, thou shalt sail against the Black River and return to Zothik. But if thou helpest us not, then shall the weasel Ezrit suck thy blood till the last, least member of thy body has been emptied thereof, and Delili shall remain forever as the bond-slave of Acharn, toiling for his avarice by day in the dark waters, and perchance serving his lust by night. At the promise of Vokal, Yadar felt something of hope and manhood revive within him, and it seemed that the baleful sorcery of Vacharn was lifted from his mind, and an indignation against Vacharn was awakened in him by Vokal's hintings. And he said quickly, I will aid thee in thy plan, whatever it may be, if such aid is within my power to give. Then, with many fearful glances about and behind him, Uldula took up the furtive whispering, it is our thought that Vachan has lived beyond the allotted term, and has imposed his authority upon us for an excessive length of years. We, his sons, grow old, and we deem it no more than rightful that we should inherit the stored treasures and the magical supremacy of our father ere age has wholly debarred us from their enjoyment. Therefore we seek thy help in the slaying of the necromancer. Though Yadar was somewhat surprised, it came to him, after brief reflection, that the killing of the necromancer should be held in all ways a righteous deed, and one to which he could lend himself without demeaning his valor or his manhood. So he said without demur, I will aid thee. Then, seeming greatly emboldened by Yadar's consent, Vokal spoke again in his turn, saying, This thing must be accomplished ere tomorrow's eve, which will bring a full rounded moon from the Black River upon Naot and will call the weasel demon Ezrit from his burrow, and tomorrow's forenoon is the only time when we can take Vacharn unaware in his chamber. During those hours, as is his wont, he will peer entranced on a magic mirror that yields visions of the outer sea, 
and the ships sailing over the sea and the lands lying beyond. And we must slay him before the mirror, striking swiftly and surely ere he awakens from his trance. At the hour set for the deed, Vokal and Uldula came to Yadar where he stood awaiting them in the mansion's outer hall. Each of the brothers bore in his right hand a long and coldly glittering scimitar, and Vokal also carried in his left a like weapon, which he offered to the prince, explaining that these scimitars had been tempered to a muttering of lethal runes and inscribed afterward with unspeakable death spells. Yadar, preferring his own sword, declined the wizard weapon, and delaying no more, the three went hastily and with all possible stealth toward Vacharn's chamber. The house was empty at that hour, for the dead had all gone forth to their labors, nor was there any whisper or shadow of those invisible beings, whether sprites of the air or mere phantoms, that waited upon Vacharn and served him in sundry ways. In silence, and, as they thought, wholly unperceived, the three came to the portals of the chamber, where entrance was barred only by a black arras wrought with the signs of night in silver, and bordered all about with a repetition of the five names of the arch-fiend Thesidon in scarlet thread. The brothers paused before the arras, as if fearing to lift it. But Yadar, unhesitating, held it aside and passed into the chamber, and the twain followed him quickly as if for shame of their poltroonery. Large and high-vaulted was the room, and lit by a dim window looking forth between unpruned cypresses toward the Black Sea. No flames arose from the myriad lamps to assist that baffled daylight, and shadows brimmed the place like a spectral fluid, through which the vessels of wizardry used by Vacharn, the great censers and alembics and braziers, seemed to quiver and move like animate things. A little past the room's center, his back to the doorway, Vacharn sat on an ebon trivet before the mirror of clairvoyance, which was wrought from electrum in the form of a huge delta, and was held obliquely aloft by a serpentining copper arm. The mirror flamed brightly in the shadow, as if lit by some splendor of unknown source, and the intruders were dazzled by glimpsings of its radiance as they went forward. It seemed that Vacharn had indeed been overcome by the wanted trance, for he peered rigidly into the mirror, immobile as a seated mummy. The brothers held back while Yadar, thinking them close behind him, stole toward the necromancer with lifted blade. As he drew nearer, he perceived that Vacharn held a great scimitar across his knees, and deeming that the sorcerer was perhaps forewarned, Yadar ran quickly up behind him and aimed a powerful stroke at his neck, meaning to hew off the head with that single blow. But even while he aimed, his eyes were wholly blinded by the strange brightness of the mirror as though a sun had blazed into them from its depth across the shoulder of Vacharn, and the blade swerved and bit slantingly into the collarbone, so that the necromancer, though sorely wounded, was saved from decapitation. Now it seemed likely that Vacharn had foreknown the attempt to slay him, and had thought to do battle with his assailers when they came, and kill the three without injury to himself, by virtue of his superiority in swordsmanship and in magic. But, sitting at the mirror in pretended trance, he had no doubt been overpowered against his will by the weird brilliancy, and was aroused from that mantic slumber only by the lethal biting of Yadar's sword through flesh and bone. Fierce and swift as a wounded tiger, he leapt from the trivet, swinging his scimitar aloft as he turned upon Yadar. The prince, still blinded, could neither strike again nor avoid the stroke of a charn, and the scimitar clove deeply into his right shoulder and he fell mortally wounded and lay with his held upheld a little against the base of the snakish copper arm that supported the mirror. Lying there, with his life ebbing slowly, he beheld how Vokal, who stood somewhat in advance of Aldula, sprang forward as if with the desperation of one who sees imminent death, and hewed mightily into the neck of a charn ere the sorcerer could turn. The head, almost sundered from the body, toppled and hung by a strip of flesh and skin. Yet Vacharn, reeling, did not fall or die at once, as any mortal man should have done. But still animated by the wizard power within him, he ran about the chamber, striking great blows at the parasites. Blood gushed from his neck like a fountain as he ran, and his head swung to and fro like a monstrous pendulum on his breast, and all his blows went wild because he could no longer see to direct them.
and his sons avoided him agilely, hewing into him oftentimes as he went past, and sometimes he stumbled over the fallen Yadar or struck the mirror of Electrum with his sword, making it ring like a deep bell, and sometimes the battle passed beyond sight of the dying prince toward the dim window that looked seaward, and he heard the strange crashings as if some of the magic furniture were shattered by the strokes of the warlock, and there were loud breathings from the sons of Acharn, and the dull sound of blows that went home as they still pursued their father. And anon the fight returned before Yadar, and he watched it with dimming eyes. Dire beyond telling was that combat, and Vokal and Oldula panted like spent runners near the end. But after a while, the power seemed to fail in Vacharn with the draining of his lifeblood. He staggered from side to side as he ran, and his paces halted, and his blows became enfeebled. His raiment hung upon him in blood-soaked rags from the slashings of his sons, and certain of his members were half-sundered, and his whole body was hacked and overscored like an executioner's block. At last, with a dexterous blow, Vokal severed the thin strip by which the head still depended, and the head dropped and rolled with many reboundings about the floor. Then, with a wild tottering, as if still fain to stand erect, the body of Vacharn toppled down and lay thrashing like a great headless fowl, heaving itself up and dropping back again incessantly. Never, with all its rearings, did the body quite regain its feet. But the scimitar was still held firmly in the right hand, and the corpse laid blindly about it, striking from the floor with sidelong slashes or slicing down as it rose halfway to a standing posture and the head still rolled unresting about the chamber, and maledictions came from its mouth in a pipey voice no louder than that of a child. At this, Yadar saw that Vokal and Voldula drew back, as if somewhat aghast, and they turned toward the door, manifestly intending to quit the room. But before Vokal, going first, had lifted the portal arras, there slithered beneath its folds the long, black, snakish body of the weasel-familiar Ezrit, and the familiar launched itself in air, reaching at one bound the throat of Vokal, and it clung there with teeth fastened in his flesh, sucking his blood steadily, while he staggered about the room and strove in vain to tear it away with maddened fingers. Uldula, it seemed, would have made some attempt to kill the creature, for he cried out, adjuring Vokal to stand firm, and raising his sword as if waiting for a chance to strike at the weasel thing. But Vokal seemed to hear him not, or was too frenzied to obey his adjuration. And at that instant the head of Vacharn, in its rolling, bounded against Oldula's feet, and the head, snarling ferociously, caught the hem of his robe with its teeth and hung there as he sprang back in panic fright. And though he sliced wildly at the head with his scimitar, the teeth refused to relinquish their hold. So he dropped his garment, and leaving it there with the still pendant head of his father, he fled naked from the chamber and even as Aldula fled, the life departed from Yadar, and he saw and heard no more. Dimly, from the depths of oblivion, Yadar beheld the flaring of remote lights and heard the chanting of a far voice. It seemed that he swam upward from black seas toward the voice and the lights, and he saw as if through a thin, watery film the face of Aldula standing above him, and the fuming of strange vessels in the chamber of Vacharn. And it seemed that Aldula said to him, Arise from death, and be obedient in all things to me, the master. So, in answer to the unholy rites and incantations of necromancy, Yadar arose to such life as was possible for a resurrected lich. And he walked again, with the black gore of his wound in a great clot on his shoulder and breast, and made reply to Aldula in the fashion of the living dead. Vaguely, and as matters of no import, he remembered something of his death and the circumstances preceding it, and vainly, with filmed eyes in the wrecked chamber, he looked for the sundered head and body of Vacharn, and for Vokal and the weasel demon. Then it seemed that Aldula said to him, Follow me and he went forth with the necromancer into the light of the red swollen moon that had soared from the black river upon Naoth. 
There, on the fell before the mansion, was a vast heap of ashes where coals glowed and glared like living eyes in the moonshine. Aldula stood in contemplation before the heap, and Yadar stood beside him, knowing not that he gazed on the burnt-out pyre of Vacharn and Vokal, which the dead slaves had built and fired at Aldula's direction. Then, with shrill, eerie wailings, a mighty wind came suddenly from the sea, and lifting all the ashes and sparks in a great swirling cloud, it swept them upon Yadar and the necromancer. The twain could hardly stand against that wind, and their hair and beards and garments were filled with the leavings of the pyre, and both were blinded thereby. Then the wind went on, sweeping the cloud of ashes over the mansion and into its doorways and windows, and through all its apartments, and for many days thereafter little swirls of ash rose up like phantoms under the feet of those who passed along the halls. And though there was a daily plying of besoms by the dead at Aldula's injunction, it seemed that the place was never again wholly clean of those ashes. Regarding Aldula there remains little enough to be told, for his lordship over the dead was a brief thing, abiding always alone, except for those liches who attended him, and the ashes that still haunted the mansion, he became possessed by a weird melancholy that turned quickly toward madness. No longer could he conceive the aims and objects of life, and the languor of death rose up around him like a black stealthy sea, full of soft murmurs and shadow-like arms that were fain to draw him doomward. Soon he came to envy the dead, and to deem their lot desirable above any other. So, carrying that scimitar he had used at the slaying of Vacharn, he went into his father's chamber, which he had not entered since the raising up of Prince Yadar. There, beside the sun-bright mirror of divinations, he disemboweled himself, and fell amid the dust and the cobwebs that had gathered heavily over all. And since there was no other necromancer to bring him back even to a semblance of life, he lay rotting and undisturbed forever after. But in the gardens of Achan the dead people still labored, heedless of Aldula's passing. And they still kept the goats and cattle, and dived for pearls in the dark torrent main, even as before. And Yudar, who had been called from nothingness to a dim, crepuscular state of being, dwelt and toiled with the other liches. He remembered but vaguely the various events that were antecedent to his death and the fiery days of his youth in Zyra were less than ashes. The promise made to him by the sons of Acharn, and his hope of escaping with Dalili, had now lost their meaning, and he knew the death of Aldula only as the vanishing of a shadow. Yet with a ghostly yearning, he was still drawn to Dalili, and he followed her during the day, and felt a ghostly comfort in her nearness, and through the night time he lay beside her, and she was a dim sweetness in his shadowy dreams. The quick despair that had racked him aforetime, and the long torments of desire and separation, were as things faded and forgot. And he shared with Dalili a shadowy love and a dim contentment.